Good morning, bonjour. I would suggest uh, to start with the welcoming remarks video from uh, Ban Ki-moon, uh, Chair and President of uh, GGGI. Uh, if we can play the video. Excellencies, distinguished participants and guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome all of you to this year's Global Green Growth Week, organized by the Global Green Growth Institute. Your participation is evidence that we, the global community, demand climate action. And I want to thank you for doing your part to drive and empower green growth. The climate crisis is perhaps the defining crisis of our times. Every year, we can read and hear more and more about the devastating impacts of extreme weather systems. And this year is proving to be one of the worst years yet with the record floods, the droughts and the heat waves all of which lead to displacements from homes, food crises, and wildfires that disrupt and destroy the lives of millions. We are destroying our hope for a better future, and we need to work together to save our planet. I'm pleased to know that so many of you are coming together to exchange ideas, solutions, and best practices on how to advance the implementation of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the framework which I helped establish during my time as the Secretary General of the United Nations. I'm especially pleased to know that many of you are joining from all corners of the world, including Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and the Pacific, and many of the solutions to be discussed are coming from women and indigenous communities who are most affected by climate change. I encourage you to take full advantage of Global Green Growth Week and engage with one another as green growth champions and practitioners. The climate crisis will require collaboration and collective action from each and every one of us because climate change knows no borders and climate change does not discriminate based on race or social class. We can transform our economies and societies and live a better future, a sustainable and inclusive future only if we work together. The challenges will be difficult and there are no shortcuts. But if we work together urgently, I think we can do it. As I have said before, there is no plan B because there is no planet B either. I hope you will join me to make the world a better place for future generations. I wish you a very fruitful and successful events during Global Green Growth Week. Thank you. Okay, um, Mikpa, just to check, uh, because I see there are a couple of issues for other panelists to join. I see Mrs. Marjolaine Kur online from AFD, but I don't see other panelists. I know that from Burkina Faso there was a problem um, logging in. 
I don't know if there is uh, something we can share or support. Mikva, any insights on that? Okay, thanks. Uh, I understand that you have received the invite to all speakers. Um, I hope we will see more of them joining now. Um, in the meantime, we could go through the program and um, let's see who is. Uh, who has joined. So again, warm welcome. Uh, this is the um, session of the Global Green Growth Week, focusing on setting the building blocks for long-term climate action, the creation of long-term low emission development strategies. And we have uh, distinguished speakers uh, today uh, to hear the experiences and lessons learned from countries that they have developed or they are finalizing their long-term emission development strategies. But also we have representatives from organizations that are working in the field that can support countries to develop their lt leds to share also their experiences and lessons learned. So while we try to address a couple of technical issues for our uh, speakers, some of our speakers to join. Um, going through the uh, program today, so we will hear uh, the experiences from Vanuatu, LT Leds, from Mr. Mark Vaivai, Director of Climate Change Department, Ministry of Climate Change and Natural Disasters. And we will have the opportunity also to watch a short video on Vanuatu LT LEDs. Uh, then uh, we will hear from Ethiopia LT LEDs experience from uh, Mr. Bamla Kalamireu, uh, who is Associate Professor of uh, Addis Ababa University. Um, then we will have the opportunity also to hear from Burkina Faso. Uh, Mr. Budasida Hamedro Amba, Head of Planning and Monitoring and Evaluation Department, uh, the Permanent Secretary of National Committee on Sustainable Development on Burkina Faso's experience on developing the long-term low emission and climate resilience strategy. And then we will move to uh, organizations that are supporting countries to develop their LT LEDs and Mrs. Marjolaine Kur will share the experiences from AFD and lessons learned. Uh, also from the 2050 Pathways Platform, Mr. Siddharth Patak, Head of Partnerships, will share also the lessons learned from uh, Platform's experience. And lastly, uh, Mr. Henry Weisman, uh, Lead of the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Initiative, will share also um, the experiences and lessons learned on supporting countries to develop their LT LEDs. Uh, let me see. Um, who is online? I see uh, Mr. Siddharth Patak is online also. Welcome. And uh, from uh, Vanuatu. Uh, could you please let me know from uh, which uh, name we can see from Mr. Wamba? Uh, who is the other who is joining? 
from Burkina Faso, if you can let me know, just to make sure. I don't see Mike Vaibe, uh, but uh, I would then suggest to play the video of Vanuatu Let's. And um, uh, there might be some technical issues. So, Mikva, if we can play the video from Vanuatu Leds, I think also the director of climate change department also is speaking in that video. So, let's um, listen and watch. To lead global and domestic efforts to address climate change, the government of Vanuatu, with the assistance of the Global Green Growth Institute, is developing a long-term low emissions development strategy or LEDs. The LEDs help support action on climate change in line with the Paris Agreement which came into force on November 4, 2016 with the aim of limiting global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. Additionally, the Paris Agreement aims to strengthen the ability of countries to deal with the impacts of climate change. Unless there are immediate, rapid and large-scale reductions in the greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to near 1.5 degrees will be beyond reach. As a long-term strategy to 2050, the Vanuatu led identifies transformational investments for Vanuatu's climate resilient future, as well as providing a framework for medium-term policies, strategies, and priorities. In the near term, the Vanuatu led supports planning for green job creation and sustainable development that will help with COVID-19 recovery. The Vanuatu led helps support global action as many countries are producing long-term strategies in line with the Paris Agreement. These strategies create credibility that the Paris Agreement goals can be achieved. They increase global transparency and trust as each LEDs demonstrate that countries are working towards a common, low emissions and climate resilient future. So in this LEDs initiative, it will help uh, the Vanuatu uh, as a country to develop strategies and policies in place to help to mitigate or reduce the carbon emissions as far as uh, Paris Agreement is concerned. Vanuatu is a member and has ratified to the convention. And so Vanuatu is taking these steps to show to the world that even though it's a least developing country that is contributing less to the greenhouse gases, it will take the first step to, f to find ways, uh, strategies and policies and to make this as an investment. But not, not only this, but it will, it will help create a green job opportunities for the different people in the communities. And in that way, it will also help to complement the uh, national determining contributions of Vanuatu and also the National Sustainable Development Plan to help Vanuatu to have a climate resilient future. This message is allowed us to this country that they must also take the, the steps to address the carbon footprints which is much more huge than Vanuatu's contribution. The Vanuatu LEDs complement and support short and medium term policies and strategies such as Vanuatu's National Sustainable Development Plan and the nationally determined contributions to 2030. These plans target a 100% renewable electricity sector by 2030 and provide a pathway towards a 25% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Vanuatu is already in a favorable position to meet this goal because of the abundance of large native forest areas that act as a carbon sink. In the years before and after 2030, much investment will be required in renewable energy supply for Vanuatu. Investing in and developing renewable energy resources such as solar, wind, hydroelectric, geothermal and copper oil will help the country to sustainably meet the developing needs of its people while supporting global efforts to decarbonize the economy. However, there is much to be done in other sectors such as transport, manufacturing, construction, agriculture, forestry, and waste management. The LED investigates options in all sectors and prioritizes actions for Vanuatu to achieve its goals to 2050.
the carbon footprint of Vanuatu is 0.0016%. And this is very little if you compare to the other parts of the world. But Vanuatu is taking the first step to address uh, greenhouse gas emission. One of the challenges that we face is a technical expertise in terms of mitigation and also adaptation. We need expertise in these areas. We need to build, we need to develop, we need to grow expert within Vanuatu. And secondly, is the issue of finance. You know, we, we, we can have a good strategies, good policies in place, or, uh, or frameworks, or whatever we call it. But if we have no funding in place, if we have no money, if we have no finance, that is not a problem. Because we, we, we can launch that uh, policy and we can just take right the shell. Vanuatu has, as far as climate change is concerned, has mainstream climate change disaster risk reduction policy into other sectors. But just to roll that out is a problem that we are, we are facing. Vanuatu LED is currently being developed through a national process with public consultation on the vision, pathways, and actions required prioritizing mitigation and adaptation, investing in government capacity, and preparing for implementation. It's a huge project. Vanuatu is prepared to take this project and to do what it needs to be done. As a small island state, we also want to show example to the world. This video is the first in a series that will outline key topics of Vanuatu's long-term low emissions development strategy. They explore how Vanuatu will address the challenges and the pathways forward for a low emissions, climate resilient Vanuatu. Thank you. Uh, that was a nice uh, overview of uh, Vanuatu LEDs uh, from Mike Vaivei, the Director of Climate Change Department. I'm checking with um, uh, my colleagues to see if there are still, I see more panelists have joined. Uh, I don't see the panelists and speaker from Ethiopia, Mr. Bamlak. Um, I don't see, I cannot see him online. And therefore, I would suggest to um, hear from Mr. Ramba from Burkina Faso, the experience and lessons learned of uh, Burkina Faso developing its uh, LT LEDs. Um, I see Mr. Wamba is joining from another profile. That is very fine. Uh, Mr. Wamba, the floor is yours. And we, we have also interpretation for um, all the attendees uh, that they don't uh, understand French. So I will pass it over to you. Uh, you have seven minutes to uh, share the lessons learned from Burkina Faso LT LEDs. Uh, you are on mute. Uh, vous êtes... Yes. We cannot hear you. Uh, no, no. We can't hear you. If you could be closer to the mic. Uh, we cannot hear you. Hello? Uh, 
No, we cannot hear you. If you can speak closer to the mic. No, still. No. Um. Let's see. We can see you, but we cannot hear you. I don't know if there is any support we can provide from here, any direction, any guidance. Uh, but uh, I hope uh, it seems the, there is another issue from 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 your side. I understand uh, you have the rights to um, to speak. Okay, um, I guess there is an issue. With the microphone of uh, Mr. Wamba. Shall we move on and once it's fixed, we can go back. Let's see now, I, I heard something. Hello? No. Unfortunately, yes, something, uh, something is wrong with the mic, I think from, uh, the other side. Uh, then let me then I, I would suggest to to continue trying to fix this issue and um, continue with the next speakers, if that's okay with everyone. Um, so we heard from Vanuatu through this uh, nice uh video um while the colleagues in burkina faso are trying to uh, fix the issue of audio and mic um then let's uh hear from the french agency for development afd Mich mrs marjolaine Kur, um who is uh a senior analyst on the Afolu sector. Uh, she could share her uh, experiences and AFD's experiences and lessons learned on supporting uh, countries to develop their LT LEDs. Uh, Mrs. Kur, the floor is yours. Uh, if you could stick to the seven minutes, that would be great. And if you can turn on your camera as well. Uh, 
Can you hear me? Attends, et, et vous escalez la caméra Démarrer la vidéo Ok. Ok. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Um, so, hello everyone and thank you uh, very much to DGDI to have uh, invited AFD to participate in this uh, event today on uh, supporting uh, LTS in uh, countries. Uh, I don't know if you can see me well, but <laughs> anyway, okay. So, um, so my name is Marjolaine Cour. I'm working in the climate change and nature division in AFD headquarters in Paris. Uh, the, st the, the division is, um, holds uh, 25 staff uh, working on the mainstreaming climate adaptation and mitigation actions in AFD projects, estimates climate co-benefits of uh, the portfolio of AFD projects uh, to report on climate finance, uh, follows international climate agenda and participates to climate events and support climate partnerships with other institutions and manages two, uh, uh, two grant facilities, one focused on adaptation in African countries and uh, another one focusing on long-term, supporting long-term uh, strategies in the framework of the Paris Agreement, uh, the 2050 facility, uh, of which I, I'm going uh, to talk and share our uh, experience. Um, ah, yes, sorry. Okay. Uh, first, I explain why AFD started to support LTS, then talk a little bit of the portfolio of the 2050 facility, and then the first lessons learned on AFD side. So, um, in the frameworks and following the Paris Agreement that invited all the parties to submit long-term low emission development strategy and uh, to make um, and to invite also the countries to align the financial flows to, uh, to a pathway consistent with long-term emissions and climate resilient development. Um, there was this One Planet, One Planet Summit in Paris in 2018, where France committed to, uh, to, to put in place to set up a facility, a grant facility of 30 million euros to help country design and uh, de design uh, long-term strategies or help design uh, works to elaborate long-term strategies. And the invitation of the Paris Agreement to that, that countries uh, submit their long-term strategies uh, by uh, 2020 already passed, but uh, the invitation was uh, submitted again in, in the Climate Glasgow Pact. So the facility has... Um, uh, the, 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 okay. uh, the facility, uh, the uh, 2050 facility has... Uh, uh, the main objectives of this facility is to help countries map out a feasible pathway for an economy-wide transformation to low carbon and climate resilient development, and also to inform, uh, in order to inform NDC revisions, policy reforms, and financing approach to mainstream climate action into development planning, and to contribute to policy dialogue and capacity building. As I said, the amount is 30 million euros, and we are having around uh, ongoing uh, projects on around, around 40 ongoing projects in more or less 20 countries, uh, where we support capacity building, technical assistance uh, studies. And we coordinate also with international initiatives and partners like uh, 2050 Pathway Platform, uh, IDRI uh, with the DDP initiatives and uh, also GDGI here. And the implementation period is from 2018 to 2023. So as I said, AFD is very committed to uh, climate, uh, to, to climate. 
um, our current strategy uh, has uh, set some uh, uh, quantitative objectives. All our, our support, all our project inv investment project uh, should be aligned to the Paris Agreement and uh, the climate co-benefits of our project should be uh, more than 50%, at least 50%. And today, we, we last year we had uh, six million uh, euro, uh, six billion euros of climate finance, uh, among which two two billion in adaptation. So on this map, you can see the the projects uh, supported by the um, 2050 facility, uh, the ongoing support in blue, and the the identification projects in um, in red. And we would like to do more uh, in African states. So, um, the the how do we work in this facility? Um, so, the the, the projects are uh, identified with our field offices in the countries, and then we have an internal committee uh, to validate and challenge the proposals. And for every project, we need to, uh, to, to sign a memorandum of understanding with the government because some projects can be just from one ministry or one academia uh, research center or, uh, or from, um, uh, yeah, can, can, uh, the demand can be from a different institution, but we need to have uh, an, an agreement with the country that it will uh, support, this, uh, that it's, it's interested <laughs> and requesting this support. And uh, the implementation is done uh, with uh, several uh, in, uh, divisions in AFD. Uh, so it's really uh, not uh, from climate division, but it's a whole AFD uh, staff who is in, involved in, uh, in these supports. And um, the support consists of uh, mainly technical uh, cooperation, capacity building in the country's institutions, and uh, tries to foster exchanges of experience through coordination with international initiatives and partners to, to build the, 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 the réseau, uh, to build the web of partners uh, to continue the work after the project. Example of supports, we, we do modeling of low carbon trajectories, uh, sectoral modeling on energy, uh, energy transition scenario, or uh, the impact of uh, macroeconomic and social impact of the scenario modeling for energy transition, for example, um, on uh, water, energy, agriculture, next, nexus in a long-term pathway in one of the Brazilian states. Um, we have some project uh, to integrate blue carbon and biodiversity and climate policies in Indonesia, land use change modeling in Mozambique. So we have several um, projects that focus on, the, on one sector or several sectors. Um, we have also projects that, that focus more on socioeconomic impacts on climate change, for example, in Vietnam and in Morocco. And we have a few projects also that tries to help formulate uh, long-term strategies in Colombia, in Nigeria and Senegal with a DDP approach, a deep decarbonization pathway approach with uh, IDRI, um, a long-term vision in Mauritius. And uh, so those projects are dealing more with um, uh, with um, um, uh, involves a lot of, uh, of academia think tanks that is working with the government, whereas the Ethiopia and Burkina Faso uh, LT leds that we are uh, financing with the support, implementing support of GGGI focuses more on uh, strengthening uh, the government institutions. And um, we, uh, we have also support to operationalize long-term strategy, for example, in uh, Costa Rica. Uh, so the, the main lessons learned from our experience that is uh, quite recent uh, is uh, first a, the, the, the mission de cadrage, as we call it, so the scoping mission at the design phase of the, uh, of, uh, the project is key. 
because of course the development of an LTS will depend on a country's national circumstances, its institutional framework, capacity, data availability, climate ambition. So uh, we really need to have a good understanding of, uh, of this context and uh, do a mapping of the different st stakeholders to be involved. Um, if the demand starts from the academia, we need also to, to see the, the link with the government. If the demand sta uh, uh, starts from the government institutions, we need also to coordinate with the academia or think tank in the country or civil organizations who have made done some work. Uh, we, so this work is needed to identify the, all the existing prospective work to build on it. Uh, on the, 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 the works that, that they already exist uh, on different institutions that is scattered, scattered on different institutions um, and not only on the official uh, national uh, government uh, documents. And in order to better identify institutional and technical gaps. Um, so we can define the most suitable approach according to the country specific context and sometimes uh, to have a gradual approach uh, to choose between government led or subnational uh, led or sectoral work or research or academia can be a, can be a better approach than starting uh, from scratch to directly <laughs> to an LTS. So it depends really on the context. Uh, another, uh, another important um, lesson we have is it's key to uh, to have a uh, key ministries uh, not only the environmental uh, ministry but also uh, the finance and planning ministry and we try to have all those uh, ministries signing the memorandum of understanding um another key uh, uh, key lesson is that uh, strengthening institutional capacity uh, is really important. It's not a desk work from somewhere else. <laughs> we need to strengthen the, the local institutional capacity at two different levels, the use of the modeling tools and to calibrate the tools in the local context, of course, and also at institutional level. Uh, we need to, help, during the projects, try to build on and and, and go even more uh, and ameliorate and improve uh, the cross-sectoral frameworks between the different line ministries and agencies to try to, to improve the nexus analysis, synergies and trade-offs between different objectives that can be conflicting. Um, and during the project also, we, we want to try to uh, improve the multi-stakeholder platforms to build on it or, or to improve them, to have more relevant hypotheses and scenario building and also feasible options that will derive from, uh, from the work. Um, we think also uh, that additional efforts could be put on um, the synergy between mitigation and adaptation because LTS is a, yeah, it's a whole uh, development uh, uh, has to have an holistic approach with all the, the issues uh, taken into account. Uh, we, we, we think we, we should have additional work also on socioeconomic impacts of the, sector, of the different scenarios uh, that are elaborated. And we think that it's hard to do perspective without retrospective. So um, we think a shared diagnosti diagnostic of the past development path of the country is important to describe territorial and sectoral dynamics and identify the main drivers. Um, another um, another uh, lesson learned is uh, we think to make the uh, LT-LEDs more uh, operationalized, <laughs> we need to do to work also not only on, um, on aggregated uh, models, uh, sectoral and multi-sectoral models, but also on specially explicit tools, uh, which will, would help involve subnational actors that could be more part of the analysis, diagnosis and scenario building. Uh, so it needs to involve specially explicit tools. Um, and this would be especially relevant for the AFOLU sector, which is quite a complex sector um, with a lot of 
different objectives, not only uh, mitigation. Um, and uh, try to work also on M MRV and land planning uh, would be to deepen the analysis on, on, on have additional support on these issues. So we think uh, to conclude that uh, when we engage in uh, LTS work, it's not just a one shot, it's, a, it's the start of, <laughs> of a long term dialogue, so we should not uh, we, we think we should, when we get involved in this, that we, we should have, a, this, this is a, we should, uh, yeah, uh, involve in several projects or to continue the dialogue, just not, as I said, just not one shot. LTLEDs is not just a document to be uh, communicated to the UNFCCC, but it's also a process. It needs regular updates and additional work to deepen uh, some analysis. Um, and it's, of course, needs to be translated into policies and investment actions. So it's a long-term dialogue, uh, which involves uh, uh, the, to deepen this partnership with the supporters and uh, the country. As DGGI uh, did, for example, in Ethiopia, it's a long-term partner of the Ethiopian um, government. Um, and we think uh, that it would be, we should try also to, when we get, if one country, one, uh, one donor supports uh, this work, this structure, uh, very important and uh, strategic work, we should find a way also to have a more collective involvement with uh, country donors. Uh, how these LTS work could involve uh, the, the different donors in the country in order to strengthen the coherence in donor actions and to build a, a collective aligned investment pipes. So I finished. I hope I'm not too, uh, I didn't go, <laughs> uh, took too much time. Um, so you have here the uh, uh, the, the website of the 2050 uh, facility. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you Bye. very much, uh, Mrs. Kur. That was a, a very uh, insightful overview of uh, 2050 facilities, activities and priorities and lessons learned. I think you highlighted some very important aspects with regard to support to countries to develop their liberality leads like strengthening institutional capacities in, in different levels, modeling, but also institutional capacity building, developing multi-stakeholder platforms, very important, addressing synergies of mitigation, adaptation, incorporating territorial uh, dynamics. And of course, this is a long-term process. It's a dialogue. We don't stop um, with the finalization of the strategy itself, but it's an ongoing process. Thank you so much. Um, let's try and see now, um, go to Burkina Faso, uh, to Mr. Wamba and see if the issue has been resolved, uh, to hear the experiences from the government of Burkina Faso. Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Can you hear us? Yes. All right. There is interpretation okay. for, the, for those who do not understand French. Uh, you can find at the bottom of the, of the screen. Bonjour. Can we share our screen for the presentation? Can we share our screen for the presentation? Is it possible to share our screen for presentation? your screen oh. okay okay uh Mihva, could you maybe show the slides share the slides yes. 
אוקיי, אוקיי. אוקיי, תודה רבה, מיכבל. אוקיי. אוקיי. זה בון? אוקיי. So thank you so much uh, for the floor so, so my name is Ramba uh, Budasida from Burkina Faso so I have the honor to, to present the vision of Burkina Faso I have the honor to present the vision of Burkina Faso on the development of long-term low emission and climate resilient development strategy So our presentation will be focused on four, four main steps. So we have, first of all, an introduction in which uh, we are able to, to, to give a little bit of background on the context. And then later on, we'll discuss about the, the, the importance of the carbon strategy of Burkina Faso. Third, we discuss about the main pillar of our strategies. And then uh, finally, we will end with the different lesson learned in uh, implementing the strategy, uh, the carbon strategy in Burkina Faso. We should say that Burkina Faso is a desert, it's a silent country, which is based in the middle of West Africa. And we are really vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Burkina, uh, Burkina Faso is part of the The, the world effort to the reduction and uh, to the long-term low emission. And we are part of uh, many uh, global pact, uh, including the, 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 the Paris agreements. So one of, uh, uh, in the strategy of the Paris agreement, we, we, it's mentioned that all the country needs to, to communicate the different strategy. And Burkina Faso is respecting this, uh, international agreement in sharing uh, the, 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 our, our local strategy. So what is the main objective of our national strategy of uh, low emission? The goal is to, to be able to, to have a planning on decarbonizing uh, the economy of Burkina Faso and to be also be able to, to, to to have a sort of framework that will help all the different partners and to be able to work with us on our five years plan. So what was the, the, the process that was adapted by Burkina Faso in the strategy? We, we should say that uh, Burkina Faso was working in partnership with uh, GGI. We signed uh, uh, an MOU since March 2021, uh, to be able to have support from GGI to be able to develop our national strategy. So we have a, a group of experts that were chosen from all the different uh, ministries to be able to elaborate uh, our national strategy. Uh, there have been also consultants, local consultants, international consultants that have been recruited in order to help the, the government of Burkina Faso to be able to put into place our national long-term strategy. And then, so in collaboration with other different experts that were chosen We are able to have a civil organization, we have non-governmental organization, and we have the public sector. So all the different uh, actors were involved in elaborating uh, our long-term strategy. We also had the recruitment of international consultants, and there was one project that was implemented 
to be able to help us implement our local strategy. Please this project was launched uh, in in presence with uh, the, 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 the president of the country, the prime minister, a different civil organization was part of this project. And they were represented uh, during the launch of this specific project. So after the launching of this project and, and the elaboration of our long-term strategy, there has been the elaboration of different scenarios by national consultants and international consultants, and also the, 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 the experts that were chosen uh, from all the different ministries and departments. And all these different reports were validated by inter an internal organ that was put into place, which is called uh, the, 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 the technical committee in charge of uh, the validation of the long-term strategy of Burkina Faso. So this committee was in, was in charge to, to validate all the different reports uh, on the different scenarios, on uh, our strategies and on uh, low emission. So after this uh, report were validated, were adopted, there's been one uh, one consultant that was recruited that was recruited to be able to elaborate the report of our strategy, and this cons consultant was able to to produce a plan that was also adopted by the committee in charge of monitoring and evaluation. And and there's been a draft that was produced and this committee has to meet uh, on Wednesday, the 26th of October in order to adopt this uh, final report, this draft report. And then after this draft report is adopted, the technical committee will submit uh, this draft document uh, to the different consultants that will make observations and suggestions to this draft document. And this will help uh, to, 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 to discuss with the Ministry of Economy that is going to give us maybe suggestion on uh, the financing part of this document before it is adopted. So it, it's really important uh, to develop our strategy of low emission strategy in Burkina Faso. We, we, we should say that our strategy of uh, long-term low emission in Burkina Faso, we help the country to respect our international uh, commitments and uh, the different agreements we signed. It will also help the country to really define a trajectory for the decarbonization of our economy uh, to the vision 2050. And so with this strategy of low emission, we'll be able to have a really solid basis that would help us uh, to achieve our uh, goals. It, it would also help us to uh, give us a sort of base for, 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 for new studies. And these studies will help us to give, uh, to help us to have uh, development strategies and all the different uh, studies. So if we're able to submit our long-term strategy uh, a low, low emission strategy, all the different documents related to climate change will, 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 will directly refer to, to, to this adopted document, uh, strategy. And it will also help us to, to adapt and to also mitigate the effects of climate change. And this will also help to have uh, uh, a national inclusion and include all the different components of society in the, the in the in the mitigation uh, to, 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 to to climate change. So our strategy uh, of low emission is based on five main pillars. So what are these five main pillars in Burkina Faso? Okay. The first pillar. So what, what are the five main pillars of a strategy? The first pillar is uh, energy transition. And this uh, energy transition needs to be focused on the energy sector and the transportation sector. So there's been action that already put into place in this pillar 
and this will help to really reduce. Uh, and the second pillar is uh, industrial growth, clean industrial growth. So this will more focus on the use. And the third pillar is the protection of the different ecosystem, ecosystem. And this pillar is main focus on the program AFOLU. So the fourth pillar is more on the waste management. Waste management, this is the fourth pillar. And the fifth, the fifth pillar is governance, local governance. And within this uh, fifth pillar, there'll be action on capacity building, on uh, institution capacity building, to be able to, to, to build the capacity of all the different uh, stakeholders and also uh, gather funding for all the different members. And this will help us to be able to participate to, 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 to adapt and to be able to reach the different agreements we sign. So these are the five pillars that we have. So in terms of the strategy, Burkina Faso decided to, to have a, a specific approach to our country. There's been uh, the choice of one international leader that is in charge of, uh, so our, the, the, the Ministry of Climate Change has been able to work with about 12 different uh, stakeholders, which are like the civil organization, non-governmental organization, and all these uh, stakeholders were able to work together. And there's been a sort of uh, participative process to be able to, to include and to involve all these different stakeholders. And uh, there's a, a capacity building, a continuous capacity building of local actors. And this will help also to develop a sort of collaboration between the government of Burkina Faso and uh, GGI. And uh, this... Uh, the, the, the consequence was that we had a lot of people that joined and a lot of stakeholders that were able to join. And there's the basis that was already created. Hello. I think uh, the line dropped. I don't see. Is back, Mr. Wamba? Okay. Yes, yes, I'm back. I'm back. So, technical issues. Oui, bonjour. So, yeah, can you hear me? Vous m'entendez? Est-ce que Bonjour. Oui, oui, oui. Okay. Please go ahead. Yes, vous pouvez vous pouvez continuer. Uh, merci. Ah. So we are at the end of our presentation. Were we able to follow? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this uh, overview of uh, Burkina Faso's uh, process of uh, LT LEDs and also providing the important elements and pillars of the strategy. Um, as you highlighted, energy transition, clean industrial growth, uh, AFOLU waste management, and last but not least, the governance and continuous institutional capacity building, um, which is a very important, again, uh, for the continuity of the LTLEDs and move from planning to implementation along with the importance of uh, participatory and inclusive process as you highlighted 
um, in your uh, points. So thank you very much. I would like to move now to Ethiopia and uh, give the floor to uh, Mr. Uh, Bamlak Alamireu, uh, who is going to share the experiences and lessons learned from Ethiopia Lens. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. If you, if you could uh, select a full screen of your presentation, is possible? Yeah. How about now? Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I had uh, difficulties technical to join in, so I managed finally. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a brief presentation uh, about the little ladies in Ethiopia. Um, so I will focus on only three key issues. Uh, the importance of elected leads for Ethiopia, uh, the main pillars and key lessons learned in the process. Um, as you know, Ethiopia is a signatory to the Paris Agreement and uh, uh, the country is keen to contribute to GHG emissions uh, by 2030 and beyond. Uh, towards this end, uh, the country has been implementing uh, green development pathways since uh, 2011. Uh, as you can see here, it was in 2011 that Ethiopia developed its CRG strategy with a focus on mitigation, and it mainstreamed uh, the CRG in its growth and trans transformation plan, the first one. Then in 2015, it came up with uh, the second growth and transformation plan where it developed uh, its uh, international, I mean, intended um, nationally determined contributions submitted to the UN FCCC. And it also developed sectoral CRGs. In 2017, it developed uh, the national adaptation plan, um, focusing on adaptive capacity and resilience. It then submitted its first NDC. Then in 2020, it developed uh, the 10-year development plan where CRG is one of the key pillars in the, in the, in the plan. In 2021, it updated its uh, NDC uh, with a focus on targets until 2030. But then uh, there is a, a policy, so to say, vacuum after 2030, and therefore, the Little Leads is an important uh, initiative uh, to fill this policy vacuum beyond 2030. So in addition to the uh, transparency and trust that it brings between Ethiopia and other international actors, the Little Leads exercise in Ethiopia will be an important uh, you know, intervention or initiative uh, to help the country align its long-term and mid-term development strategies, uh, focusing on climate mitigation and adaptation objectives through a holistic and long-term planning approach. Uh, in terms of the pillars, uh, we focused on transport, energy, agriculture, forestry, and other land use, uh, industry, and uh, you know uh, the processes there and waste. The key lessons learned, uh, well, uh, several lessons were drawn from this important intervention with the support of uh, Triple GI and uh, other important actors. Um, uh, you know, from day one, the government was on board through uh, sectoral uh, you know, working groups, uh, two, uh, five sectoral and two cross-sectoral working groups, total seven were uh, on board uh, on day one. And this is an indication that the government owned the, uh, the activity and uh, there was an active engagement actually it was two biweekly uh, meetings uh, and discussions. This is one important uh, lesson, uh, you know, to develop a sense of ownership uh, in the process. The second important lesson was that there was a model-based approach for each sector, uh, having a bottom-up approach before integrating the models, the attempt was to 
uh, you know, model each sector with a specific models as appropriate to each, each uh, sector. And finally, um, using uh, green uh, economy modeling approach, there was an attempt to, to integrate uh, into one modeling exercise, uh, taking parameters from each sector. The other important lesson was the uh, engagement of different stakeholders. Uh, there were consultations and feedback. Um, it was possible to solicit information and feedback from the different sector, I mean, uh, stakeholders. And uh, most importantly, there were capacity building exercises um, uh, with experts coming from Triple GI and, and other uh, you know, actors. So to summarize, there was a lesson that bringing different stakeholders on board on day one would benefit a lot to own the initiative and move it forward. Secondly, that involving stakeholders was also important to solicit information and feedback in order to improve the, uh, uh, you know, the financial strategies and the scenarios and um, the trajectories. And the model-based approach was, like I said, bottom-up, and that was an important, actually, lesson that we tried to draw. So these are uh, the issues I would like to uh, raise in brief. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bamlak. Uh, that was uh, very insightful and thanks for respecting the time. That was uh, a nice, concise uh, presentation. And um, I will keep uh, a few of the lessons, important lessons learned that you highlighted. Uh, for instance, the importance of the government engagement in a continuous basis and also the multi-stakeholders engagement to uh, provide validation uh, to the process and the different scenarios uh, for Ethiopia uh, long-term strategy. Uh, also, you highlighted the importance of the bottom-up uh, modeling approach, which was in, um, uh, combined with an integrated uh, cross-sectoral uh green economy modeling approach and of course the series of stakeholders consultations and engagements in combination with the continuous capacity building activities which was also uh, highlighted uh by the previous uh speaker so thank you very much um let's see uh because we uh somehow uh, deviated from the initial order of speakers i would suggest now to move to the next speaker from the 2050 uh pathways platform mr siddharth patak who is the head of uh, partnerships uh to hear uh the experiences um, and uh, lessons learned from uh, platforms um, support to different countries to develop their lt lets um, Mr. Patak, the floor is yours. Thank you, Silius, and sorry about the a lot of sunlight. Well, it's it's an unusual thing in London to have that sort of sunlight, but I'm um, very happy to join all of you, and thank you for inviting the platform. And really interesting presentations from Burkina as well as from Ethiopia on the experience from the long-term strategies. I thought I'd use the presentation to sort of talk about some of the experiences that we've had in supporting the long-term strategies across different countries. And it is truly a very mixed bag of lessons learned depending on the country as well as depending on the, the level of... Um, uh, maturity of that country's long-term strategy or planning process in itself. But before I move to that, uh, just to give a bit of a background around the 2050 Pathways platform, the platform is basically a government and multi-stakeholder initiative that was launched at COP22, uh, primarily to support countries in developing their long-term strategies. It adopts a big tent approach where we try to work with many stakeholders, including uh, AFD, a lot of the MDBs, as well as IDRI. So a very mixed bag of stakeholders who are 
supporting countries in developing their long-term strategies or are adding to the broader intellectual as well as the broader information and knowledge uh, dimension of the long-term strategies. Though the platform has 36 member countries, we work with quite a few non-members and you can see some of the spread across in the map. And we work quite closely with some of the donors uh, from the bilateral agencies as well as with MDBs, primarily with an intention to accelerate the sort of support that is provided for the long-term strategy. The platform in itself supports countries um, financially as well as through uh, pro bono technical assistance and trying to connect them with uh, other experts that might be helpful in the long-term strategy process. Coming to some of the overarching learnings, uh, starting from uh, some of the sort of uh, broader parameters in itself, when the platform launched and when the Paris Agreement uh, invited countries to develop their long-term strategies, there was a lot of interest on the long-term strategies, but mostly in the developed world. You can see many of the long-term strategies initially were submitted from European countries or from a lot of the North American countries. Uh, but now there is a growing interest within developing countries also with many of the emerging economies submitting their long-term strategy in the near future but also a lot of the LDCs as well as SIDS developing their long-term strategies in the near future. So there is an increasing interest in developing the long-term strategy in itself that we've seen. And that is sort of also uh, augmented by the fact that the previous COP directed or invited more countries to submit their long-term strategies. And also there is likely to be, well, there is going to be a synthesis report that's going to be presented on the long-term strategies this year. Some of the observations around the approach, because for the platform and a lot of other conversations around the long-term strategies, the approach does matter uh, and it makes a difference to the quality of the long-term strategy. What we've seen in the past uh, few years is that the approach still is very much around emission-oriented modeling. So you do draw out or you do develop models that allow you to have a sense of where your emissions are. But many countries are starting to look at the confluence of development as well as economic growth and climate policy. That particular bit is very important because in the long run for most of the countries, there are competing priorities that interact with climate policies. Uh, and this is not just a developing country issue. It is an issue that happens across all countries where there are competing priorities and how they interact with climate policies over a period of long, a longer period of time is quite important. You can already see that in the context of Europe and with the, with the, um, the current conflict ongoing. So it's very, now we're starting to see many countries actually looking at the long-term strategies and looking at both these issues of competing priorities, development, economic growth, as well as climate policies and developing the long-term strategies with that sort of an approach instead of a modeling only approach uh, and just demonstrating what the long-term emission trajectory for a country looks like. It is becoming more about what a uh, long-term sort of direction of travel for the country would be, including its emission profile, including its policy sort of basket, including its sort of broader momentum towards different issues in itself. So that's one of the things that we've observed around the approach and the changing evolution of that. In terms of ambition, uh, when we started with the long-term strategies, net zero was not necessarily a very strong concept. I think over a period of time, that concept has taken center stage within the long-term strategy process. Now, if you're not doing a net zero strategy, your long-term strategy in itself is in question, which is a very interesting sort of uh, development in itself. It also sort of creates a lot of ambition within the long-term strategies, many challenges for developing countries, particularly that have to uh, sort of develop and meet certain developmental goals much earlier than anticipated. Or again, there is a lot of competition in terms of just resources on reaching that. But yes, net zero is quite central to some of these strategies, which were very mitigation centric. But now you're starting to see that adaptation and resilience is becoming quite an important issue to be dealt with within the issue of the long-term strategy in itself. It is not an easy issue to deal with over a long period of time, but the initial starting point for many countries is alignment of policies around adaptation, as well as the alignment of NAPs, NAPAs, in light of the long-term strategy in itself. 
the other sort of key issue that's emerging primarily from a net zero conversation is also land use but also now countries are starting to look at beyond energy and many of them are landing on the sector of agriculture which is not very easy to deal with so again one of the lessons learned for us has been that there is an evolution and uh, marjorie sort of pointed to that as well that land use is quite a critical sector if you're looking at net zero and it's not very easy to work over a long term in land use especially because the domestic stakeholders and poor farmers are quite central in many countries especially developing countries on this issue so that's another sort of big learning that has emerging that land use and agriculture are two sort of key spaces that will evolve over a period of time if you're looking at the long term strategy process in itself finally coming to the operationalization part of it where countries have done a first iteration of their long term strategies there is little finance currently in the system and that's a sort of a constant issue with many of us developing climate policy that to implement the policy in itself there is very lim limited finance but hopefully that is being ramped up there is interest from many institutions to actually provide greater amounts of money to support the the transition to net zero or the transition in general so there are, the capacity on finance is or the provision of finance is increasing but another sort of key bit that we've seen very clearly is that there is limited alignment of lts and ndcs in many countries and that is quite quite stark in some of the countries where the two processes have not necessarily been aligned or, or have been done into different sort of silos so it would be important to bring these two processes together in order to ensure that the finance is adequately directed into spaces that need or require that sort of transformation but are also aligned in a broader sense the other bit that is quite important that we've seen is socialization of the long term strategy is not necessarily very uh, clearly done so many stakeholders are still unable to look at the long term strategy or still don't know that it exists uh, within the government and even within the societal sort of stakeholders so it is quite important for countries now and some of them are trying to operationalize their long term strategies by first socializing it and you can see that in the cases of south korea you can see that in the case of japan as well where those countries have done quite a lot of lastly the revisions are already starting to play take place some long term strategies are already outdated revisions have started happening which is great there is also deeper engagement around specific areas where countries feel that there is more interest in developing more transport waste some of the sectoral stuff that is emerging from the long term strategies is now being uh, looked at more deeply including broader issues of macroeconomics trade as well as export um, uh, export sort of contingencies that that might be needed over a long period of time so i thought i'll i'll keep it towards some of these insights and trends and hopefully i'm in, i'm i'm within my time uh and happy to answer any questions and thank thank you again for inviting us thank you very much that was very insightful presentation providing us the trends uh currently on the development of uh, long term strategies from the experience of the platform um the approach does matter as you highlighted and uh, we see that uh, eventually uh, countries are moving uh, from emissions modeling towards uh, addressing also economic growth and development priorities and also looking on on how those compete with each other synergies trade-offs um, so that's an important development we see on the um, lt lens and also around the ambition that it seems that the net zero is a common target now for uh, not only developed but developing countries and of course, uh, again, here, the, um, the competing priorities with uh, other development objectives, uh, including adaptation, is an important aspect that is also um, evolving in the, in the process. So thank you very much. Uh, we have one more speaker, um, uh, last but not least, from the uh, Deep Decarbonization initiative uh henry weisman from idri will share the experiences and lessons learned of the initiative uh, regarding the support uh it provides to uh countries to develop their lt lets 
the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stelius. You hear me well. Can you confirm just? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. And um, thanks for inviting me to share some of the lessons learned from the uh, GDP initiative. Uh, I will just obviously be very brief because uh, in the interest of time, just will give you a sense of who we are, what we do, but essentially what are the key messages that we can derive from our experience on deep decarbonization, which um, I mean, we've been working on the topic for nine years now, we've been created in 2013. So some of the lessons start to emerge. Uh, sorry. So who we are, first we are a network. And here I've just provided a map just to give you a, a sense of where we are working. So an international network of in-country partners uh, that's uh, for us, obviously, the, the key of the, um, uh, uh, of, the, um, of the network. So we have in-country partners, the different colors mark. The, so the countries in red are the countries in which we are currently operating. The countries in blue marks country where we have some in-country partners, but who are not active these days, but could very well be activated. And the countries, and some of them have been mentioned in other presentations, for example, you see Nigeria and Senegal who've been mentioned by colleagues from the AFD uh, because that's where we are uh, developing a project in collaboration with AFD. The countries in green are the countries where in a way or another, we have some light touch engagement or exploring the opportunities. So that's what the DDP is. Plus obviously a network of international research and strategic partners. Many of them are around the table. Uh, notably uh, AFD is a key partner as a 2050 Pathways platform is a key partner. We have many other colleagues we've been working with very actively on the topic. Uh, so who we are, what we do, our activities. And here I'd like to stress something that has been said, but uh, is extremely important for us is that our activities represent what we see as the two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, we develop some robust analysis of pathways. When I say we, it's the country uh, partners develop a scientifically robust analysis, but we are not interested in uh, doing the analysis independently of the processes. So we also use this analysis to support engagement with decision makers and stakeholders based on the insight from these activities. And what a deep, deep decarbonization pathways project is really a combination of these two elements and the analysis is sought as the analysis that can be relevant to support engagement. The approach, Country-driven, country-led, country-owned, I guess it's clear from us. It's an international initiative, but that is developed by in-country partners that aims at reflecting the specificities of each country circumstances, that aims at being useful for the country processes and be appropriated and owned by all the relevant stakeholders in the countries. That said, uh, what brings us together is that we have an international community of practice. Uh, I will obviously not enter into the details of the, the methodology, but uh, will flag a number of specificities in my um, conclusions regarding the, the main messages for how to conduct the deep decarbonization story. So here I'm just listing a number of studies just because I know that the present, I guess the presentation will be shared uh, broadly and so people can easily find the most recent of our reports with uh, the links directing to them. Uh, and here I move directly to, uh, I have one slide on the messages uh, uh, in substance and one slide on the messages regarding the method and the way to approach deep decarbonization. And you will see that uh, many of these conclusions will equal a lot of things that have been uh, mentioned by colleagues in previous presentations. So the, the conclusion from the set of studies that we've been doing since 2013 in the number of countries we've covered show that carbon neutrality is feasible uh, by 2050, 2070, depending on the countries, but just that's uh, that may sound rather um, um, uh, obvious now, or maybe more or less obvious, but when we started back in 2013, that was obviously not at all clear. And that's um, a message that we want to really to, to, to convey very clearly from all the studies that have been done in all the countries we've covered. And maybe even more importantly, that these objectives can be achieved simultaneously with the key socioeconomic objective, the development priorities, as defined by each country. When we do a deep decarbonization pathway, maybe the, the label may be um, misleading because it, it may um, convey the idea that we're interested only in reducing carbon emission. That's not at all what we do. We're interested in development pathways that are compatible with carbon neutrality, but primarily we start by the requirement in terms of socioeconomic goals. 
Uh, a key message that we see from the analysis is that basically delaying action is a dead end. I, that's a message that is coming uh, very clearly from the international literature. But here we see in all the analysis we are doing at the country level that delaying action forces basically you to do more emission reductions later while being less prepared to do so. Because when you start investing in uh, solutions in the short term without having the goal in mind, Locking, that's something that is extremely visible in the detailed country studies. Uh, the coordination of actions, when you, basically when we look at all the actions that are required to conduct the deep decarbonization pathway, we see that it's not only government, government has an important role to play, but it's not only government, it's a combination of action by all actors, sub-nationals, um, business, uh, civil society, investors, etc. So uh, the role of the deep decarbonization strategy should be to try to align the perspective of these different actors. Um, last, uh, last but one message, which is extremely important. What we see from analysis is that there is no silver bullet policy instrument. Obviously carbon pricing, it can be important, but it will not solve the problem and policy packages will be needed. And the role of the analysis is not to prescribe the tools, but to inform in detail the transformation that need to happen as a way to inform, given the specificities of each context, what are the tools that could be most relevant to trigger these transformations. And a final message, which is uh, uh, emerges very clearly from the in-country analysis, is that basically it is impossible for any countries in the world, especially developing countries, but uh, all countries actually, to envisage deep decarbonization consistent with carbon neutrality if you don't make assumptions that the rest of the world is going also. Because there are some numbers of international conditions that will uh, facilitate or uh, make more difficult the transition. So it's a matter of international cooperation that will be critical and either we'll go all together or we will not go at all. And when doing a national analysis, it's extremely important to start by an acknowledgement of the international condition that can make the deep decarbonization transition possible in a given country. Uh, moving to the uh, almost final slide on the message. Uh, all the work that we've done shows that there are a number of things that should be done if we want to uh, investigate deep decarbonization concretely. First, not insisting too much, but thinking within structured systemic dynamic and context specific strategies. I get that the motivation of all this session and uh, all the points that were made by everyone. So I get that everyone is already convinced of that. So we'll not insist more. Um, maybe insisting on se a set of uh, methodological aspects that we've covered that prove particularly important. One is backcasting. Backcasting means that you start from the requirement of where you need to be in the long term. Usually we take 2050, but it can be 2060 or whatever. But you start by that and try to understand how to move from the current situation to reach this objective. That's critical because otherwise you face a huge risk to just envisage solutions that are maybe that look good in the short term, but that uh, may be a dead end that may create some risks of locking that will prevent you from achieving the long term objectives. Uh, another key message is that uh, it's very important to take a non normative approach. There is not one single option that can be envisaged. In any country, there are several options, and everything is a matter of choices that need to be made. And the role of the long-term strategy is to explore options, to clarify the choices, and to make sure that decisions are made with full uh, acknowledgement of the impacts and the consequences of different choices. Uh, sectoral deep dives, that's been mentioned very critically in a number of, um, um, of um, previous interventions. Uh, we need to go into the details. We need to open the box of the transition. The, a deep decarbonization or long-term strategy exercise, it's not, um, uh, cannot be a superficial exercise, cannot remain at the surface. It needs to enter into the specificities of each the transition of each sector to try to understand what are the mechanics of change that need to be uh, put in place. Uh, the modeling question, uh, it's been mentioned also several times here. Uh, just, I am a model as a background. I love models. I think they are extremely useful, but uh, the point made by, uh, not only by CEDAR just before, is extremely important. The LTS cannot be only a modeling exercise. Otherwise, you will miss number of levers that are very difficult to capture in models, but critical in real world. 
and probably you will have difficulty in engaging with stakeholders because you will use the language of the models, which is very often not uh, a language that's audible to decision makers. Uh, want to mention also the last three points very quickly, uh, the need to scope properly the, the studies in each country. Uh, it's very important to make sure that the studies uh, that conduct to LGE LEDs uh, capture all the specificities of country circumstances, which means that you need to take time before launching a study to go and meet people, to understand their capacities, to understand their problems, to understand their needs, and to design the study according to these specificities to be as relevant as possible. The point of involving stakeholders throughout the process has been made several times, so I think that's, that's a, a given, but uh, that's very important to keep in mind that, again, it's consistent with the fact that it's not a modeling exercise, it's a way the process matters more than the product that the document you have eventually, and involving the stakeholders is critical. And the final point uh, is the continuity. The LTLEDs needs to be a process that continues over time, and for that, establishing robust in-country capacities, both on the technical and the institutional side, is critical if we want to make sure that the, the countries can benefit as much as possible from uh, the, the benefits of a long-term low emission development strategy exercise. I want to conclude here by flagging where we are. So what I've described is the lessons of what we've done over the past almost decade. What we are doing starting now, we are starting a kind of third phase of the project where our ambition is to increase the breadth and depth of our impact by going, doing both more in-depth engagement in number of selected countries in which we are, so playing an active role, notably on the engagement side, but also trying to support the dissemination of our approach and of the lessons that we've learned in as many countries as possible. So that's kind of a, the next phase of the deep decarbonization pathway initiative that we are taking uh, now and uh, we'll be very keen just to collaborate with, uh, with everyone on this objective. And I stop there. Thanks a lot again for the opportunity and uh, very happy to continue being engaged with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, many important points have been highlighted uh, at this presentation. Um, just to name a few, to highlight a few, uh, we're talking about the systemic dynamic approach here. Again, approach matters, uh, having the target clear and uh, going backwards to, to make sure that we plan in order to achieve that target through backcasting. Again, you highlighted very well the importance of the process. Uh, modeling by itself uh, is not gonna um, uh, bring the solutions, but it's a process and should be inclusive and participatory uh, and modeling can support the process. Um, and of course, scoping is very important to understand and diving to understand all the specificities of the countries. That's also very, very important. Thank you for that. Um, we don't have much time. Um, I guess um, we should wrap up. I, this is very unfortunate with the uh, problems we, we had with the technical issues. Um, but I think the presentations from the speakers uh, we're uh, very rich. We had uh, the insights from the countries Vanuatu, Burkina Faso, and Ethiopia highlighting the processes and the main lessons learned and, and main pillars of the developing their LT LEDs. Uh, clearly here the participation, the inclusiveness of the process, uh, was highlighted as an important element uh, of the of the LT LEDs, but also institutional capacity enhancement was also highlighted as an important point. Uh, continuous support and engagement with different stakeholders, and of course, uh, considering different um, uh, different. Uh, uh, priorities, development objectives, in, including adaptation. Uh, that was also um, a key element that was emphasized by the uh, other speakers. 
uh, from AFD, uh, 2050 Pathways Platform uh, and IDRI, um, on the importance of the institutional uh, capacity and continuous engagement with stakeholders. Uh, the process matters that was clearly highlighted. Um, so it's a combination of modeling and uh, continuous engagement with different stakeholders large range of the spectrum of, of stakeholders engagement. Um, and of course, uh, it's important now to, to go beyond the energy transition and look to, to other important aspects that was highlighted. And, and we see that countries are picking up on that. We see a, a, a clear uh, prioritization of AFOLU, particularly when we talk about um, um, countries in Africa, for instance, uh, it's a major uh, sector, uh, both for development, but also for um, the carbonization of the economy, looking on more integrated approaches, uh, and of course, uh, incorporating them in the economy-wide uh, modeling. Um, looking on different priorities and objectives, uh, and I think uh, I try to highlight the key uh, components and elements that uh, our speakers uh, brought up and emphasized in this uh, presentation. So with that, um, we wrap up. I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for this uh, very valuable and insightful um, uh talks uh thank you so much for joining this is a continuous process as you highlighted so i'm sure we will have the opportunity to further uh, interact engage and work together to support countries to develop the long-term low emission and climate resilience strategies i would like also to thank uh all the attendees uh that they uh joined the session i hope you found this uh session fruitful and we will make sure we share the presentations uh of our panelists and i would like to wish you a uh, um, fruitful continuation of the global green growth week there are a few more days to go so there are many interesting uh, sessions uh, going on. So I would like to encourage you to connect. Thank you so much and um, all the best. Bye.